I appreciate you guys being here to worship the Lord. I'm thankful for those who are at home or wherever they may be, uh, also worshiping as well. And uh, is anybody glad to be in the house? Amen. I hope you are. Um, you know, I hope the one thing that this time that we had out has done, and I mentioned this last week, is that we never become complacent about worshiping the Lord. Amen. We never get to a place where we're just bored with worshiping the Lord. Now, I have heard, just like you probably have, boring preachers. Can I get an amen? amen. You want to know how I know that? I went back and, and, and listened to some of my sermons, and I can say there's sometimes I've heard boring preachers. Amen. But you know what's not boring? Is that Jesus Christ still saves souls. Amen. amen. You know what's not boring is that God still performs miracles daily. Amen. You know what's not boring is the fact that you have access to that same God right here in this moment. And I hope that none of us ever take that for granted. Amen. As Pastor John mentioned a few minutes ago, tomorrow we will observe Memorial Day. And this is a time where we'll remember, we'll honor, and even some cases we will grieve for those who have lost their lives while fighting for our country in the United States Armed Forces. We are thankful for their sacrifice and the immeasurable cost to their families. Amen. This morning, I think it's quite fitting for Memorial Day to be coming tomorrow because this morning I want to talk about battles. I want to talk about war. Now, not to disparage the men and women who wore the uniform, who gave their lives so that I can enjoy the freedoms that I have today, but there is a much more important war that is going on, and it's going on right now, in this instant. It's more important than any war that has ever been fought between factions or armies or nations, more important than all of those combined. This fight goes on for every single human being. And no, I'm not just talking about a human being, I'm talking about for every single soul. You see, right now in this church, right now at home, wherever you may be, right now you hold something that is more valuable than any stock you can buy. Amen? More valuable than any mansion you can purchase. It, more valuable than any car you could ever possess. See, right now you hold on, you cling to something that is eternally valuable, and that is your soul. Can someone say amen? You control something that is more valuable than anything you can see or come into contact with in this lifetime. We fight every day for that soul. We wrestle with entities that goes far past flesh and bone or man-made weaponry. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? You see, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you have struggles. You have bumps in the road. You have obstacles that seem to instantaneously pop into your very path. And if you can relate to that this morning, let me hear you say amen. We fight. We wrestle with this. We struggle. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ this morning and you know about that struggle, say, I struggle. Oh, there's only two or three Christians in here, or there's only two or three Christians that struggle. Let me say that again. If you can relate to the fact that following Jesus Christ is not always easy, let me hear you say, I struggle. I Amen, I do too. I'm glad I'm not alone. You see, just like those brave men and women who gave their lives for our country, there are men and women who have fought not for this country, but for their souls. Guess what? You're one of them. You're one of them. And unfortunately, I believe that there are far more casualties in this battle than any world war, than any civil conflict. There are far more battles that have been lost. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 says this, 
It says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Why? Because the alternative to pursuing a life of living holy seems so much easier. You know what the Gospel of Matthew just told us? There will be few who make it. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the type of verse that, that makes the little hairs on my neck stand up. Few. This is translated from the, uh, the Greek word oligos. And what that means is a small quantity, a little number. Like I said, these are the kind of verses that should make us worry. Now, I'm not saying that you should question your faith. No, no, no. But what I am saying is you should recheck your focus daily. Amen? If you have decided to follow Jesus, then you are in a battle. You are in a war. This morning, we're going to discuss that very war. Turn with me, or scroll with me, if you will, in your Bibles this morning to the, uh, to the book of 1 Timothy. And we're going to be reading in chapter 1. 1 Timothy Chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. amen. If you're at home, shout out a big amen. Type it in the comments. We'd love to know. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. If you're there, let's go. If you're not, just listen up. God's word says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightiest war a good warfare. Holding faith and good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Verse 20. Of whom... Hermonius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. Oh yeah, you read that right. The Apostle Paul is saying, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day and we think about those who lost their lives. And most of the time, if someone gave their life in war, we remember them fondly, don't we, Brother Ray? We, we call them heroes because they are. But here's my question for you in this spiritual war, in this spiritual battle, and it's the title of my message. How will your battle be remembered? How will your battle be remembered? Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to get up here and share your word. Father, I'm thankful for any platform that you allow me and entrust me to be able to share your word. Father, I pray this morning I do nothing that hinders anybody's worship. Father, I, do noth I pray that I do nothing to somehow uh, handicap someone's understanding of your word. Father, I pray most importantly for the movement of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you pour it out on this service this morning. Father, I pray that lives are changed. Father, I pray that complacency is done away with. Father, I pray that you, we are encouraged. Father, I pray that we are convicted of our sin that we sit in in this very moment. Father, I pray this morning that when we depart from this house, if you are to tarry, you're coming. Father, I pray this morning that we wouldn't dare leave here without doing business with you. Father, this morning I pray that you touch hearts. Father, I pray that you change lives. Father, I know there's nothing I can do or say or no amount of persuasion that I may be able to spew out that will change the hearts of men and women. But Father, I know that your word does. And that's what I pray for here this morning. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. How will your battle be remembered. Let's look at the things or some of the things that led up to these three verses in 1 Timothy chapter 1 this morning. Paul has sent Timothy, or rather dropped off Timothy, in Ephesus. And he did it for a specific purpose. He did it so that uh, he could deal with some of the issues that had come up in the church. And these centered around false teaching. Amen? Perversion of the gospel. Look around. 
because that happens every day. You don't think so? When you go home, just flip on some TV channels and see some TV preachers. Perversion of the gospel is rampant. So here, Timothy was dropped off at Ephesus to address false teaching of the church. And some of these problems, they were more severe than others. But overall, you know what the church needed to do? They needed to focus on God in order to become and to remain healthy. How many of us pray for a healthy church, a healthy body of Christ? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, I'll read it again. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightiest war a good warfare. The first point of the message this morning is a question. What are we equipped with for warfare? What are we equipped with for this spiritual battle, the spiritual war. In verse 18, we see an apostolic charge. We see a command given directly to Timothy. And what, what was it? If we read from the start of this chapter, we'll see that Timothy's command was to forbid the teaching of false doctrine. Where do I get that from? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, this is what it says. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, of, uh, some that they teach no other doctrine. You see, there were people teaching doctrine that was contrary to the very word of God. Amen? there's ever a preacher, evangelist, pastor that gets in the pulpit and says more of I believe than God's word says, guess what? That's the time that your antenna should go up. Amen? That's the time you should start testing what they say against the very word of God. Because they're relying more on their own understanding than they are relying on, what, on how God leads. Not only do we know that Timothy's command or, his char, or what his command or charge is, but we also know by Paul's writing that this charge foretold or was foretold to him somewhere in the past. You see, Satan was running rampant in the church. Amen? The serpent had slithered his way amongst the body. The devil comes to take that which wasn't his, comes to kill, and comes to annihilate the church. Amen? He was doing it then, and guess what, brothers and sisters in Christ? This morning, he is doing the exact same thing. Oh, well, Brother Danny, that's nothing new. Then why aren't we living like it's true? Why aren't we living like it's true. We go through nonchalantly. We'll sing a song. We'll listen to a message. Amen. We might even pray a prayer. But then we get out in the parking lot. And everything that we just said. Or everything that we just heard. Somehow goes away. Now some of that might be flesh. Some of that might be Satan. Distracting you. As soon as you hit those doors. But it is not just Satan that tries to steal our focus or the focus of the followers of Jesus Christ. You see, it is our society that also tries to distract us. It is our culture that tries to take us away from that which is important and that which should be imperative to every Christian. Amen? Don't get quiet on me. The TV shows we watch. The music that we listen to. <laughs> the company we keep. Not only is it Satan that tries to distract us, not only is it society that tries to distract us, but it is also our very flesh that tries to rob us of our focus. Will somebody say amen? Amen. If you believe that Satan is out to destroy us, say amen for me. 
If you believe that this culture, that this society is out to rob the focus of the follower of Jesus Christ, let me hear you say amen. If you know about that constant battle you have with your flesh, your own flesh, when it fights against the things that you know is the right thing to do in the eyes of God, say, Matt, my flesh fights against me. Say it with me. My flesh fights against me. One more time, in unison. My flesh fights against me. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you do. Satan, society, and our flesh... It breaks up relationships. It divides churches. It causes spiritual sluggishness. And it causes lackadaisical worship. It leads to people trying to fill voids in their life. Satan's society in our flesh leads people to become more concerned with how much is in their bank account than how much they serve God. Amen? It makes spouses look at other people other than their wives. Amen? It leads people to to drinking. It, It leads to gambling. It leads to lying and stealing. It leads to anger and wrath. And just in case you think I'm picking on other people, Sister Becky, I know you're going to get mad, but it leads people to sometimes be more concerned about what's on their plate for dinner than what they're spiritually getting fed from God's Word. Amen? Nobody is above it. Nobody is exempt from it. And the more you take a stand for Christ and try to faithfully follow Him, the more you will be attacked. If you can't say this morning that you're not spiritually struggling, odds are you're not following Christ. But all of that, believe it or not, wasn't my first point. Can anybody tell me what my first point was? I'll put you on the spot. No, that's okay. I've talked a lot. What are we? Uh, thank, uh, Sister Carolyn, I'll give you a dollar. Make it ten per Wes. Take it out. Of, take it on his account. The first point is, what are we equipped with? Because, see, we are equipped for this battle. We are equipped for this struggle. We are equipped for this warfare. We have tools in our tool belt. We have weapons in our arsenal to fight this spiritual war. Amen? We fight this war with the Word of God. We fight this battle with prayer. We get through this conflict with the Holy Spirit And here's the best part. We overcome it all with Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 John chapter 5 verses 4 and 5 say this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world. But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. This morning, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? You know, sometimes people lose in these battles. They don't overcome. And they don't lose because they didn't know what the right thing was to do. It wasn't lack of knowledge. And it's not because they did not know how to overcome the battles and the obstacles. But sometimes, more times than probably most of us care to admit, more times that that really should break a believer's heart. Sometimes, they lose because of a deliberate effort to reject their faith. 1 Timothy 1, verse 19 says this, holding faith in good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made, if you're reading with me, what does that say? Have made shipwreck. If I were to ask you right now, church, what is the most famous shipwreck? What, when you hear shipwreck, what comes to mind? What would you say? What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> 
I, I'm hard of hearing. You got to tell me later. Titanic. I thought Titanic. Show off. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, that's fair. That's fair. Most people would say the Titanic. Brother Jeremy one up me this morning. <clears throat> One of the most famous, if not the most famous, behind Paul's shipwrecks was the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Billed as the unsinkable ship. Most everybody knows that. Amen. If not, Leonardo DiCaprio will tell you. <clears throat> there are a lot of Christians that believe, just like people believe the Titanic was unsinkable, there are a lot of followers of Jesus Christ this morning that believe they are unsinkable. And it's not because of their faith in Christ, mind you. It's just because they are so spiritual. They are so in the word of God. They serve so purely and so effortlessly that they think they are above the attacks of Satan. That they think they not, do not become distracted by what society has to offer. They think that they have power over their own flesh. Just like the Titanic was billed as unsinkable, there are Christians who believe in their own minds they are unsinkable and unshakable. The Titanic killed more than half its passengers. Amen? When it went down, more than half of its passengers. You see, when we start to dabble in sin, when we start compromising our faith, it's not just us that impacts Amen? We take people with us, whether we care to admit it or not. The Titanic was traveling at 22 knots. It's over 25 miles per hour. Now, that doesn't sound very fast, amen? But when you're over 26,000 ton, and you're in water, and, and there is no brakes to hit, it's moving pretty fast, Amen? Society does a great job at distracting us with all the things we have or it has to offer. Almost everybody you talk to, when you ask them how their week's going, oh, I've been busy. Hey, uh, can you do this this weekend? No, I, my next three weekends there's something going on. Can, can you relate to it? Amen? Maybe it's just me. We move through this life very, very fast. Sometimes so fast that it's impossible for us to put the brakes on. And we're just going to continue the course that we started because we feel like it's impossible to turn around and go back. How'd the Titanic sink? Iceberg, right? It hit an iceberg. But here's the thing. Most of the things you read... Now, there's other, uh, there's other theories out there, right? But most of the things you read, I hope we get real serious about this. Most of the things we read says that it wasn't the top part of that iceberg that they could see and they were actually trying to navigate around. It wasn't that that sank them. It was those jagged edges of ice that laid beneath the water that pierced the hull of the ship that caused them to take on water and eventually sink and led to the killing of something like 1,300 people. You see, when we dabble with sin, and we think we got a hold of it, and we see it in front of us, or even our, in our peripheral, you know what we don't see? All those underlying things that are right beneath the surface that we don't realize that we have to deal with and keep at bay. Satan, society, and our flesh is out to make a shipwreck of our faith. Our world is set up in such a way that for the follower of Jesus Christ to fall into easy traps of sin. Laws being passed that openly say, you know what? It's okay. What God's word calls an abomination is legal. And it's not just one or two, the ones you think of. Plenty. Plenty. Accessibility of, of pornography. Widespread, easy to get. A society which war awards aggression. Attack 
on traditional families. But here's the thing. No matter what Satan does, no matter what society does, if we maintain our focus on Christ, we can overcome and win this war. Amen? Our salvation from all these things, the willful revolt and rejection of God, or unknowing entrapment of the world, how we overcome is Christ. Jesus does what for us? He redeems us, delivers us, He saves us, He forgives us, He rescues us, He restores us, He empowers us, He overcomes, He breaks, He heals, He loves, He cares, He comforts, He carries, He speaks peace, He removes condemnation, He removes guilt. Is that all that Jesus does? No, because He repairs brokenness. He frees us. He watches over us. He shepherds us. He feeds us. He shelters us. He provides. He protects. He opens our eyes. He grants repentance. He changes desires. He replenishes us. He fills us up. He sanctifies us. And He pronounces righteousness over all who believe in His life, death, burial, and resurrection. Church, can someone please say hallelujah? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 20 says this, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now I don't know about you, this is not an easy text to grasp. Because here he's saying he is willfully turning someone over to Satan. Maybe that's just metaphorical. Maybe that's an allegory. Maybe so. But it's kind of hard for us to say that we believe that the Bible is the very word of God, the literal word of God. And anytime we come up against something that we just can't wrap our minds around, we say, oh, that's just a metaphor. We know nothing of these two men. If you do, don't break my heart. Just tell me afterward, okay, and I'll correct it next week. We know nothing of these two men other than what Paul spoke here. Paul seemingly dis, uh, disciplined them for what? Their defiance to God and their heresy and their behavior, or in both. Paul was no stranger to calling people out, amen? The book of Romans chapter 16 verse 17 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Paul had no problem with identifying those who were at odds with the gospel. He had no problem with calling out those who were contradictory to the word of God. The third point I have for you this morning is that the body of Christ, the, the, the church, helps protect you in this spiritual Warfare. Amen? Paul speaks of turning people over to Satan, and that means that they would not enjoy the same protection which they once had. Did you get that? You can't turn over something that you didn't first have possession of. This protection necessitates the churches willingly and compassionately, but strongly. To go to great lengths to call its own to repentance. You know what that means? That means if you're doing wrong, then you should repent. Brother Ray, if you see me, or Brother Mike, if you see me, Brother Jeremy, if you see me doing wrong, then you should call me to repent. That doesn't give us the excuse to be a jerk, okay? It should be from a place of love and compassion. The church calls its own to repent. It also means that God may use various painful events, uh, events and situations and circumstances to bring you to repentance. And that's the part we don't like, right? Because we love hearing that God is love. Amen? If we were one of them churches that said God is love and 
put in a couple of dollars and you'll get a million back, we'd have to beat people off with a stick to keep them out of the parking lot. I've tried to get for years for West to put free gold out on the sign out front. And when people come to get their free gold, I'll say it'll be on the streets of heaven when you get there. <laughs> West won't do it. Chicken. Now, this does not mean, brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't mean that every sickness or loss is a messenger of Satan sent from all to point out some area of sin in your life, right? Sometimes people get sick. Sometimes things happen. But it should make us take an inventory of our life to see if we are right with God. Are we where God wants us? Are we serving as effectively as he's called us to? Are we doing the things and keeping the things which are most important prioritized in our life? Self-assessment and self-awareness is always a positive thing. In fact, God's word calls us to do it. But here's the question, and this is the part that none of us can get around. Believer and unbeliever alike. This is what we have this morning. Is God tearing down idols in your life for repentance? The Bible also tells us that there are some, some weeds in the grain. And they'll be cast into the fire, amen? Is He speaking to you about your salvation or your walk with Him? Is your walk real this morning? Is it where it should be? If God forbid something happened to you this day and you step into eternity, there is no one in this house or hear, can hear my words this morning. There is no one in this house or watching online that need to go to hell. Why? Because there's no more plainly than it can be said. If you're sinning, you know you're sinning. Stop it, confess it, repent of it, and follow Jesus. This morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? We can laugh it off and we can joke all we want to. But for every bad thing you do, and guess what? You do bad things, one day you will give an account for it, whether you believe it or not. See, that's a beautiful thing. I could go out there and stand in the middle of traffic and say, there's no car that's ever going to hit me. Well, eventually I'm going to find somebody that's looking at their cell phone, and they will smack right into me. They'll probably damage their car pretty good, but they'll, they'll hit me. And just like that car hitting me, one day you will stand before God, and there's one of two places that you're going to go. An eternity in heaven with God, or an eternity in torment and pain in that fiery furnace right there with the devil. And that's the choice you have as the unbeliever this morning. And I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. Amen? I'm just trying to tell you the truth. There is no one who hears these words that can ever wholeheartedly say, I had no clue what God's word was. Here's my challenge to you this morning. Are you where you're supposed to be? If not, repent. If you are, great. How many people are you telling this to? How many people are you sharing the gospel with? How many people did you invite to church this week? I don't know. And you don't have to tell me. But God does know. Amen? He does. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you so much for your people and their attention this morning. Father, I'm thankful for those who came out this morning for whatever reason. Father, I'm thankful for those who logged in online to hear this message today and may hear it in the future. Father, I pray this morning that because of you, hearts were challenged. But Father, now, just like I prayed at the beginning, I pray that not only are we challenged, but Father, that we take a step of faith to do something about it. Father, I pray that lives will be changed. Father, I pray this morning that if there is someone in this house that does not know you, that they will repent of sin and they will run to the cross. Father, I pray 
that as both believers and unbelievers alike, that we don't take any of this as a laughing matter. But Father, we are serious about the fact that hell is real, but so is heaven. Father, I just pray for an outpouring of your spirit over this house this morning. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. In Jesus' name, I pray all of these things. Amen.